computer spinning. It says preparing to live stream, but it might be live streaming already. So don't say anything nasty. No. <laughs> don't say any F nasty. words. No Fs or Ss. Can't, can't monetize if you say the F word. <laughs> yeah, true. Now, I just got to see this. Okay. I can see the chat. The first one of these I did, I couldn't see the chat. And I was oh, like yeah. looking, I was looking in the comments and I'm like, why aren't there any comments? And then I looked after and there's all this live chat that I'd missed. I didn't see any of it. Were you thinking that nobody was commenting at all? Yeah. I'm like, shit, oh. nobody's commenting on this. All right. So we're live. We've got my good friend, Mikey Erg, who I think now this ties you for the most appearances on Live from the Rock Room, Mike. Nice. You're tied Ooh. now with Josh Goldman. Uh, well... Yeah, so, that we, we have a little nice little running competition where <laughs> at, at every show we have to at least be in two bands and at fest we have to be in a million bands. <laughs> yeah, the last the, the last time you guys came through it was funny because what we did did we do three bands that day? Yeah. Or four. We did the three. Mikey Erg band. We did Doc Hopper, Doc Hopper, and, Lo and Loose Behavior. Loose Behavior. Cause, cause, and we probably would have done Slow Death if Slow Death hadn't already been there with a different lineup two weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you were in all three of those, yeah? Yeah. 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 I was in all four bands on that tour. <laughs> That's awesome. And Johnny, I got to meet fairly recently as well. He came through with Limbeck. Before the world collapsed. Yeah. <clears throat> That was... Yeah, that was the crazy thing about that uh, that tour that I did. That was like it was all all four bands, and I was playing in all four bands. And it was like I got home from that tour, and essentially the world ended like right right after that. I got one in before one whole tour. <laughs> nothing yeah, got canceled. One, nothing got canceled. No, because it was like oh, wow. um, we we got home March first, and then I had another tour uh, with that band Warriors that was. Uh, starting March like 13th or something. And we played the first show and then that's when everything was like, okay, Dang, everything's canceled. Man. Done. Sorry about that. Yeah. It was a bummer, but you know. didn't you have a, you had a Europe tour scheduled too? Yeah. I had a Europe tour that was like, um, that was, uh, due to start like right in the beginning of May. Uh, like May May first, I think it was supposed to fly out, and that we kind of like were holding against hope for a while, hoping against hope for a while, and like we were just like, finally we just called it in like at the end of March, I think, we're just like this isn't happening. Like I think a couple of the countries had extended their ban the travel bans and stuff, and we were just like, well, it now it's impossible, so now we have to cancel this tour. Yeah, you would have never made it home probably. No. I'm no. seeing a, I'm seeing a comment that did did you make Devin Kay's girlfriend cry? Apparently I did. <laughs> How did um, this happen? I don't really know. he like we talked about it once and he was just like, yeah, I don't know. Like there was a part you you like I think, you know, it was probably like a dopamine show or something in Chicago where like we all stayed at the house and of course it was a gigantic house party. And I guess like I was being loud, and uh, his girlfriend couldn't sleep or something. Oh. I think that was that was the gist of the. Uh... Were you saying <laughs> I was like, there? was it at her house? I have no idea. Like it, uh, like because the song the song came out, and I was like, I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> and uh, and then like we ran into each other, literally ran into each other on the street at fest, and he's like, hey man, I'm sorry about that song. And, it was just like a dumb joke <laughs> and uh and then like i think later that night i i got up and sang it with devin k and the solutions at fest so all is forgiven then or all, all is forgiven yeah. okay cool like... <laughs> we had devin k we had a re devin k in the solutions sessions session recently we posted two of those videos and that one's one of my favorites it's such a unique and cool band yeah where did they have like the whole like horn section and all that shit they had one one i think their trumpet player was sick but their trombone uh, player was there yeah when uh last year at fest they played right before my band played and it was the first time i'd seen 
like him with all of that. <laughs> like I think there was just a ton of people on stage. It was awesome. Yeah, I watched their I watched their rock room videos, and I just think like how how is this band not really huge? Yeah, <laughs> like they should be huge because it's it's like very fun to watch and it's like very catchy. Yeah, but it seems totally. like they should be a giant band. So John, as a drumming singer or singing drummer, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I guess. I, Elvis Costello, I think, once said singing drummers are a bummer. Didn't he say that once? I'm that sure makes perfect that. sense. That story adds <laughs> up, yeah. So, I've never heard that. Now I'm now I'm bummed out. It's gonna be the bummer <laughs> hour. Did you what did you learn to play first, John? Guitar or drums? I learned to play drums first and I'm I'm self taught on everything that I do. So even me playing guitar, I never like I actually when I play guitar, I don't know what chords I'm playing. I just know like bottom string fifth fret you know it's so it's real basic knowledge but when i first started playing drums it was essentially because my dad was a guitar player and i he bought me sticks and i was like watching mtv and beating on all the chairs in the house and the couch and stuff and i think my mom was like okay get him a drum set so he stops ruining my furniture <laughs> and so he got me a drum set and then that we started playing together when i was like nine years old and that's kind of what started it all like an obsession with John Bonham too. Cool. It's it's like you're reading my autobiography. <laughs> and then, so <laughs> as literally, a, literally the same thing. <laughs> oh my God! Really? Is your yeah, dad a well, player too? He's a he's a drummer actually. So he just gave me like one of his old drum kits. But it was definitely like my mom's dresser was splinters <laughs> at, at a point, and and yeah, I was just playing along on the on the dresser to everything and MTV or very early on and. It probably, so, it probably sounded really cool. That's what oh, I yeah. Did, right? yeah. It sounded great. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you, Mike, when you started? Um, I started, like, actually with the drum set. Because my dad my dad owned a recording studio for my entire life, pretty much. Um, uh, so I would, always, I would always just go to the studio and just bang on his drum sets, like, when I was, like, old enough to hold drumsticks. Um, so, like... But I feel like probably around like eight or nine is when it started to sound halfway decent. When I actually could figure out how to keep time and uh, keep a actual beat. Um, Keeping time is really important when you're a drummer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I like I, I've never I've always said I've I've never I've never been into like being flashy or being like, you know. Neil Peart or whatever. Like mm -hmm. I, I'd always, I always just wanted to be Ringo. I just wanted to like, hey, keep time, <laughs> dude. You, you and I have like the same have story, literally. It's so funny, yeah. yeah. I always <laughs> wanted to just serve the song and and not over yeah. anything. Because you know you could be a drummer and do a ton of fills every measure, but that's just not the kind of player I've ever wanted to be. Yeah, I mean you know like I love that. T I, I love Rush. I love uh, you know all of. I love watching it. Like, I'm a huge Zappa fan. I love watching like Terry Bozio just like do a drum solo for 30 minutes. But it's I know that I can't do that, and you know that's not me. So I was like, let me just be Ringo. If you listen to the very early Pope <laughs> stuff that I was on, it was very Phil heavy. And then really, I learned... <laughs> what was your like? What was your influences early on? Uh, who, I... were, who, who were your influences? Definitely Bill Stevenson was, yeah. was like the most. Like obviously I couldn't play along to Descendant songs when I just started. Like when I first started, I was playing al along to a lot of like Tom Petty and the replacements, yeah. like stuff with like the simple rock beat. At yeah. what age was that? Um, I think I was like thirteen. Oh, okay. I had like a, I had like a brat, a spoiled brat fit like one Christmas. Where I decided, like, I, I wanted a drum set and nothing else. Yeah. So I told my parents, like, I want a drum set or nothing. And then they got me a drum Taking set. Taking a stance. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I like it. <laughs> so did it you, worked. Did, That's good. Did you start out always, like, when you started playing drums, Did you were you always open like that? Yeah, I had no idea that that was even a weird thing until, like, years later after I started. because. So are you, are you left-handed? Or... I'm left-handed. Yeah, so, and you just play the right-handed kit open. Because the funny thing is the only other drummer I knew 
was Glenn Porter, who was he was the original Alkaline Trio drummer. Mm-hmm. And we went to junior high together and started playing about the same time. And he played the same way. That's so, very oh, wow. strange. So he's <laughs> open-handed too. So he was the only other guy that I would like watch on a regular basis because we'd do shows in his garage and stuff. And it was always like he's in two or three bands and I'm in a couple bands and there's maybe one other band. But I would see Glenn all the time and he played the same way. I didn't even know that like you're supposed to like that was the right That's way. So funny. It's a very wacky coincidence too that it probably made that seem more normal seeing Glenn mm-hmm. in your scene as well. Do that. Yeah, because I, I think he was probably the first other person I saw like live play a drum kit. And, you know, I didn't have... I don't think I even had MTV when I started playing. So th- it wasn't like now where you can just pop on a YouTube video. You know, it's like probably 19... Yeah. I don't know what year that was, 1980-something? Yeah. So a little different than now where you can, like, pretty much learn how to do anything on YouTube. I kind of wish yeah. that <laughs> I... um. I learned more with my left hand earlier on because when you watch Ringo, he leads, I mean, he plays crossed over, but he leads with his left hand. Yeah. And that's why his fills are so unique. Yeah, absolutely. That's that. Yeah. That's one of the reasons you can always tell it's a Ringo drum track. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He definitely has a style where you can, he's one of just a few guys, I think where you hear even just a straight beat and you can tell that that's who's doing it. I yeah, think Ringo totally. is one of those guys. Like <clears throat> Mick Fleetwood is one of those guys. Mm-hmm. You know, it could just be that like single kick hit and single snare, straightest beat you can be. And if it's Mick Fleetwood playing, you can tell that that's who's doing it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, Bonham and Bonham too. Like, absolutely. There's there's this great like, uh, they reissued all of the Paul McCartney and Wings records at one point, and Wings at the Speed of Sound came with a bonus disc, and there's a a demo of one of the songs that just happened to, like I think Paul was in the studio John came to hang out John Bonham came to hang out and Paul was like oh I, I got this new demo play drums on it and that demo is on this reissue and it's just like Paul playing like a you know playing the piano for a minute and then all of a sudden you're like and it's immediately you can tell it's Bonham you don't even have to <laughs> look at the liner notes and it's, it's it's amazing to hear him play on a Paul McCartney song. Do you think if he went in to go to record with like a modern producer today as like an unknown drummer, do you think they would quantize him? I wonder. Yeah, probably. Fantastic and then if they, if they did, he would never know. Nobody right. would ever know cuz like he's not on the he's not like dead on the beat. No. At yeah. all. No, yeah. none of those guys were. No. Like, I bet some I asshole would it. quantize his shit, <laughs> grit it up. I yeah. hope not. I hope, like, he seemed like a pretty tough dude, so I don't know if he would stand for that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it seems like it seems like music is kind of getting a, a, away from that a little bit, but especially in punk, like the slick punk records, like the higher budget ones the last mm-hmm. eight to ten years have been so quantized up it's like hard to listen to yeah for me it's not music you know it's just like why do they have the drummer even track the drums at that point why don't you just like program it because you're going to quantize it and sample replace it anyway so why waste the time yeah up the drums yeah it's weird I, i you know i you know i understand like wanting it to be listenable but i i don't understand it being note perfect yeah, it's very bizarre. I think because a couple of big records must have been that way, and then everybody's like, I want to sound like that. Yeah. And so... And I've, it, even, I've even done records with producers where I'm recording to a click track, because I, I love recording to a click track. It just makes the song that much tighter, and mm-hmm. adding things is easier. And I'll, I'll do a, a full take, and it'll be a keeper, and then the producer will say something to the effect of like, okay, just well, let's take a half hour. He's like, I have a mess to clean up here. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, that's, that's crazy. Like I literally could play that 10 more times. It'd be pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I don't really know what you need to edit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've had similar experiences where like mixers are like, oh, can I, can I nudge these 
drum tracks around and like I don't even hear what they're talking about. Like yeah. to me it sounds like that's how I played the track. I suppose it's probably not like dead on the beat, but like does it need to be? Like no, absolutely not. No. I mean that's a that's a that's a human being playing drums. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean there are guys there's that uh Matt Walker fella from Chicago who's like mm. a beast and he probably can play just about a hundred percent on the beat if he decides to, but like most humans can't do that. There's like five guys. Josh yeah. Freeze. Josh yeah. Freeze probably can. Which was weird with him joining the replacements for all that, the reunion shows and tours, because that band was so quintessential into like almost falling apart all the time. Like that's their yeah. charm. And then once Josh Freeze is in the mix, it was just like a little too perfect to me. I mean, it sounded great. It was amazing, but like there was that element of things falling apart kind of was not there anymore. Yeah. But I think like there was, there was a bit like I, when I saw them at riot fest, I was like, okay, they are still like towards the end of the set, they started fucking around and doing like covers and shit. Totally. I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is the replacements. I think if Josh wasn't here, it would, this would be a total mess now. Now it's at least <laughs> like, I, I, you know, but I, I, I agree that like, it wasn't the same as seeing them in 1984 with Chris Mars, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Matt Gilligan is here now. Just so we know. I don't know. Does anybody know Matt Gilligan? I do know Matt. He's a He's good here. man. He's here now. Hey Matt, go away. <laughs> Who was the, uh, I will say in, uh, I think it was 2015 or 2016, the Pope's opened up for, uh, for the replacements two nights in Chicago. And there was plenty of mess even okay, with good. Josh freeze. I have Sweet. a feeling that I think that because I I literally I'm so glad I went to that riot fest because every other time they came through either in the area or anywhere else I was like away or couldn't get tickets or whatever so that's the only time I actually got to see them I'm so glad I went because I, I wouldn't have forgiven myself if I didn't see the replacements when they got back together they had a guitar player with them I don't know his name but he was incredible like he nailed all of the Bob and Slim yeah he parts. was he was in that band, The Neighborhoods, from Boston, like, kind of mid eighty, early mid eighties. They're so good. Um, but yeah, he, he was he, and that the Riot Fest thing was so funny because he, I think they were doing Swing and Party, and he had like some like chorus effect on his guitar, <laughs> <laughs> and Paul like just stopped singing. He's like, take that fucking Cure thing off your guitar. I'll get Bob Mold up here. I'll get Bob Mold up here in a second if. <laughs> it was just like classic replacements moment, like right in the middle of the set. And but I guess, <laughs> I guess just to finish away. my Josh Freeze like perfect <laughs> drumming thing with the replacements, there was like there's a lot of moments where he's playing and then he's doing like his like Josh Freeze thing, mm -hmm. like he's doing like arm tricks and stick tricks, and then there was a time where they were playing really maybe I O U or something they're playing. And he was playing it with one hand, and he like took his Gatorade and took a sip, yeah. and it was so perfect. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay, fuck you, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't do it. Like, I pretty much have to play two handed at all time. And if, like, even if I drop a stick, I'm I'm in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, you Same know, here. For, at least for like a couple seconds. Like, oh shit, <laughs> what am I doing? I always forget to put an extra stick somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I always you? forget to. Uh. <laughs> I put them there like almost every show, except for the times when I need to have it. There. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and then it's it's not there. <laughs> My friend Travis has or used had this trick where he put the stick in his back pocket. Hmm. I've that seen that. Dad. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's a good awesome. idea because it's just right there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Very smart. Smart yeah, move, Travis. Totally. Totally. Well, we're coming up on twenty minutes. Maybe we should start playing some tunes. I'll kick. I'll be the opening band. All right. I'll Sounds play first. Good. I'm going to play a Weezer song um, awesome. because it's short because cool. I want to sing for as short of time as possible. <laughs> but this song is like two, I think it's about two minutes long. It's Knock Down Drag Out. Is that on the green? Oh, well, it's it on is. green, yeah. It is. yeah, yeah. All right, so I got to move my mics a little bit. And grab the guitar.
What sounds uncomfortable? Something sounds uncomfortable, according to Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe the moving the microphone sounded uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm going to go headphones with. <laughs> that song in a long time I've been working on a, I was gonna do a full covers record of Weezer songs and then I've done about six songs and I kind of got tired of it so it's I think it's <laughs> gonna be an EP now an EP nice yeah. done and done perfect <clears throat> so let's let's uh, get a rock and roll tune from John Philip I could do that what are you gonna play for us I am, I'm going to do a song called Number On Me, and it's, uh, it's off my first EP, and it was actually my first recorded song. I um, was really upset with an ex-girlfriend of mine, and I came up with it in nice. like 15 minutes off of that. Number On Me. <laughs> Yeah. 
Very nice. Thank Beautiful. You. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. All right. What do you got for us, Mikey? All right. Well, I figured I'd do a, do a tune off the, the new 7-inch that I just made. Um, I did this I did this record thinking I was going to go on tour in Europe and I wanted to have a new thing to sell for the tour. Tour ended up happen not happening, but the 7 inch did happen, and I'm psyched about it. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the 7 inch is rooted in my uh, love of old pop punk, and this is uh, one of the sun. This is like my uh, Dan Vapid Riverdale's ballad pastiche kind of thing. <laughs> the song's called "The New Departure Blues." And when the sun went down, I made a getaway Suddenly in France, I made it out okay But with the question marks, I know I'll be alone Another fever pitch, another busy tone And if you ever achieve and take me as I am Now I'll be the one, nobody knows again But if it stands, I say What is that, that song called? The New Departure Blues. The New Departure Blues. Somebody asked in the chat. <laughs> I listened to that. Uh, I listened to that EP yesterday. It's really good. Now Thank I'm gonna you. have a, a, a lot of hard times getting that chorus out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we did another. There's a rock room video from another song on that EP. Was it Colleen? Yeah, Colleen. Yep. Yeah, there's a song called Colleen. If you look on the through our videos on the channel down there, uh, you can find a produced version of Colleen. I love <laughs> these live streams, but I miss being able to like actually mix the shit. Right. Yeah. Like make it sound good. It's, like yeah. this. These. This is a pretty good setup. Everybody here has like a, a real microphone, which is unique. <laughs> yeah. It's a unique situation. A lot of it's folks. Gotta help. Yeah. I was trying to get Josh uh, from the Popes to get to get an interface in a mic but he's he's being hesitant he's scared of technology yeah, even though this technology is it, this is like 50 year old or 100 year old technology <laughs> i saw him just like in his bathroom it looked like right or something at home yeah or just that a living last... room or something okay <clears throat> but i mean he doesn't really need much help to sound good he sings so good but that That's was true. like watching the thing last week i was just like these fucking songs <laughs> 
are just so good. Did you? Did either of you see him? Uh, did you see him do like somewhere over the rainbow on his personal Facebook? Oh yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a buddy on a couple of weeks ago, uh, Travis Brown, who was he was texting me beforehand that he was all nervous to do his, but he had like just watched Josh do that video. Yeah, and I'm like, right. well, that's not what you want to watch before you come and do one of these. <laughs> like, that's not the thing to watch. Watch the puddle of mud doing Nirvana. Like, watch that, and then you're gonna feel pretty good about what. I've you been do. watching that on repeat lately. So. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Talk more about the mics. Do you really want to hear more about the mics, Bobby? Because <laughs> I can see Mikey Erg there has an, a Sure SM7B, SM7B. which is it's a fantastic mic. As do yep. I. And I just got a nice uh, a Beta 57 that I've been meaning to buy for years for to just to bring around to clubs when you used to be able to play live music uh, to have my own mic. Uh, I, and so now I just was like, oh, I'll get it now and at least up the live stream game a little bit and then I'll, I'll use it if we ever get to do that again. Yeah, the 7B is a great mic. I didn't realize that John had one up there, but now I see it. What's the nice. mic right in front of you, John? That is, I, I heard that it's a Corby. I've never used one of those. It looks cool. Yeah, I don't know what model it is, but that's kind of what my slapback is going through when, when I hit the slapback button. Nice. I need to get that going. I'm talking into, I should probably not be using this particular mic because I have a couple of mics. I have a Shure um, KSM-8 that they gave me very nice of them to give me that mic. I use that. That's what you can see Mikey singing into in his latest Rock Room videos, and it sounds great. I also have a Shure SM7B, and I have a bunch of Lewitt audio mics that they gave me, and I'm talking into the AKG that I actually paid for. <laughs> uh, it, this is a AKG C414, and I have a... I call it the 414 because of Milwaukee. The 414? Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't even realize that because I'm not a true Milwaukee and yet I haven't <laughs> lived here that long. <laughs> and then I have a little like small diaphragm condenser. Um, I'll say it's one of the Lewitts um, that you can't see when I'm playing guitar. We do have the same headphones. I'm just not using them right now. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I use things. These are great. For drumming, I have some weird brand ones that like cut like 48 decibels. Mm. I use those for drumming. These are these are more comfy though. I don't know what kind of headphones John's wearing. I can't see. Sennheiser HD three eighty Pro. Ooh, fancy. Those I nice. think are fancier than than these Bayer Dynamics that Mike and I are using. <laughs> I love those because of that plush. Yeah, I love. Ear. Yeah, and I think they just sound like. They're just very neutral, which I like in. Like if I'm like doing a, a home recording and like doing a mix or something, I don't have any like I don't have monitors, so like I just use these and they're kind of comparable to just Yamaha like those monitors or whatever. God, you you won't even need monitors, you know, because you're you're probably used to how these sound. So yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and why spend a bunch of money in in these times right now too? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I figured let me get a couple of mics and you know spend the money that way i think that's one of the few industries like that's actually doing really well right now is all the companies that make home recording gear yeah. i saw a thing about how <laughs> right. like sales on uh i think like sweetwater and reverb.com like their sales are crazy through the roof um i thought i thought it i might have read that reverb's getting like a million visits a day on their website or something that's wow. awesome i mean like, you know when a when a home recorded record wins best album of the year grammy it probably puts a puts something in your brain very true. <laughs> is that what happened was that the, uh the billy eilish record is like oh wow that was all done in a bedroom <laughs> her brother really knows what she's yeah. doing though yeah <laughs> um i also <laughs> i also wonder how much like ps4 or like just playstation and xbox too uh, those sales went up <laughs> i'm sure I think that, yeah that switch uh, switch yeah that sold oh, out yeah, the switch, everywhere yeah. didn't it mm -hmm, it did everyone Everybody's... playing that animal crossing yeah aching to get rid of that twelve hundred dollars <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah i think we're, we're gonna need more we're gonna need another 
twelve hundred. Fortunately, I have I've my job is still cool because I've always worked from home. But uh, I I know a lot of folks that have well, like folks like Mikey who tour for a living, or the guys yeah. that like book the tours for a living, like that. That's been just wiped out, which is scary. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I feel, I feel see, bad for all of them. Waiting to see what happens. Well, you can go to Oklahoma and play shows, apparently. Uh, yeah, Arkansas. Arkansas? There's like a pod. They're, they're putting the audience. Everybody's going to be in a pod, I think. Oh, because I thought see. I read a thing. Oklahoma, their governor said starting like Monday, you can play. You can play shows. Go Brewers, I see in the chat. Yes. That makes sense. I wish I was I wish the Brewers were playing right now so we could root for the Brewers. <laughs> Same. And the Bucks too, after that great season they had. Yeah. So back onto music though. So I guess we all started playing drums first. Mm-hmm. So I'll start with John. Like from being a drummer, what led you to start playing guitar? Uh, my, since my dad was a guitar player, he always had guitars sitting around. So just out of curiosity, just grabbing them and trying to tinker around. And he showed me how to play kind of a bar chord with just your two fingers. So then I started playing along with Nirvana and stuff when I was like 12 and 13. And then when I was about 15 or 16, I was playing drums in a couple bands. But then this, this band from where I live wanted me to play second guitar where I didn't have to play lead or anything, just, you know, bar chords. It was a pop punk band that, like, just Green Day worship stuff. And so once I started playing with that band, I started picking up the guitar a whole lot more. But I never started writing my own songs until about two years ago. Cool. How about you, Mike? I, uh, yeah, I play, I play drums in, like, all through all through middle school and and like kind of like mid middle school like seventh grade I, I joined or eighth grade I think I, I joined a band and played drums and that was my first like real band that played any sort of shows and we were kind of like a classic rock and a blues cover band um but then like around that time that was like 92 93 excuse me and then 94 like you know, 94 is kind of right when, I, you know, when a lot of my generation got into punk rock because, you know, Dookie happened and Rancid and all that stuff. Uh, and then I I'd had a guitar for a long time, never really learned how to play it. But one night I just got out a Beatles songbook because Beatles have always been my favorite band since I was like, you know, a year old. And I just like because so I knew those songs at the back of my hand. I just got out the chord book and like just looked at the chord shapes and spent all night and I just taught myself how to play guitar in one night pretty much uh you know wasn't good at it for a while but taught myself chords and then like also taught myself like I was also kind of getting into punk at the same time so taught myself like where every note on the neck was so then I could do power chords and I could play punk rock as well um So it all just kind of like in my mind, it all kind of happened in like a few days, but I'm sure that's not true. (laughs) But, um, but it was definitely like very quickly. I just kind of taught myself and like, I I heard an interview with Elvis Costello where he said all he wanted, all he wanted to do was know enough guitar to be able to accompany himself to write songs. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And so I didn't learn any leads. I didn't learn any, uh, scales, none, none of that. I just learned chords, and I was like, "This is all I need to be able to write songs." And I stopped there, which I shouldn't have done. But <laughs> I, I stopped exactly where you stopped. Yeah, <laughs> like I knew, I knew power chords, and like I know the open chords, the basic open chords, and power chords. Mm-hmm. And I've been playing guitar for probably thirty years or more, and like that's all I can do. Yeah. I, I don't. If you tell me play the such and such scale, I have no fucking idea what that is. Me neither. Yeah. No clue. Same. And I think John doesn't know that either. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. No. Or John, do you? You don't even know the the notes. Do you? Like, if you if I, I told you like play a G chord, do you know what the? I know a G and an okay. E. That's it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love that. 
when I was making that, that the last mini meltdowns EP, Scott Shanebeck, our bass player, I was he was asking what chords I'm doing. I'm like, dude, I literally have no idea. I'll send you a video of what I'm doing. And then I'm like, maybe I should learn what chords I'm playing. He goes, No, don't. It's not important at all. It's like, okay. I won't. Yeah, it's it's definitely not important in, until you play with somebody who's not a person that learned how we did. Like people that learned just like by ear and just picking it up, usually you can like send them a demo and they'll just like figure it out. Yeah. But then if you play with somebody that was kind of trained and learned from like reading sheet music, they want you to explain like what all the notes and the chords are. And usually I don't know, like I know like, you know, what an E is or what a D is. But if I do like a weird chord, there's like na there's names for all of those chords and I have no idea right. what, you, what you call them. Yeah, I, I always do the like, you know, you're on the A and then you slide down to the G sharp on the first finger and I don't know what that's called. Yeah, what do you I, call that? I use, I, I use that all the time. And there's like the, the uh, I call it the weaker than chord where you're just like, you're playing a D and then you go. <laughs> like, I always mm -hmm. see John Sampson do that. I have no idea what that is. Oh, <laughs> weaker than it's chord. <laughs> and there's there's got to be a name for it. There's got to be. And I know there is, but I don't know it. Maybe and John my, K. Sampson knows it. <laughs> my chords are more weird because I'm lefty, but I play it strung righty. So like, oh, he oh. looks like that. So is that. And that's what Chris does too, right? Chris Rowe? Yeah. So like my that, power chords look like that. That's so crazy. That's I, I was. Uh, but never the, actually, that That's the chord you were talking about. Like, yeah. What is, What's that chord? Because <laughs> like the, the my friend Amanda who plays keyboards in the bigger empty like I, I do those chords in every song almost and I just yeah it's like it's that chord that I do that's how I say what that one is. It's I wonder if there's yeah there's probably people that are just screaming at their computers right now. <laughs> Maybe somebody will comment in. Be like, I'm waiting. Apparently, teach us. <laughs> Somebody agreed with the weaker than chord, but I'm waiting for somebody to identify what that other chord is. Because, <laughs> it, I mean, it's in, like, most songs. Yeah. I would say, like, at least half of the songs I've written use that chord. Yeah. In some, I, I, some form. I've probably done it, yeah, in most songs. <laughs> I just love the way that sounds. So that what was, note. like, the motivation for you fellas to, like, write your first tune? You can go first, Mikey. It's a good question. Um, I I just loved music and I loved songs and I knew that I like loved it so much that I probably could do it if I wanted to. And then, yeah, like you know, I before I even knew how to play anything, I was writing like lyrics and like melodies, but and they were uh, terrible, but. I was definitely like doing them and like taping them because I had, I grew up in a studio pretty much. So I like had a four track when I was very young. And um, so I just make these like four track demos of just me singing, like weird, but, and then, or like just playing like before I knew how to play guitar, play like going up the E string and just writing songs that way. None of those were like at all good because those were like, you know, pre middle school, even maybe. Um, <laughs> wow. But yeah, and like around the time I ta taught myself how to play guitar, I wrote a song called More Vocal in the Monitor, which is on, <laughs> it ended up, it ended up on like an urge seven inch. It's like, it's, it's the earliest song I ever wrote that was like, a, it was the first song I ever wrote that I was like, okay, I'm not embarrassed at all by this song. And, that was and that was like pretty early on but it was like yeah just listening to music and being like i want to be able to do that i want to be able that's to an important that element that to not be embarrassed by what you're doing yeah i remember watching last friday's um live at the rock room with rob and even being in the van for hours with rob mclean you know i didn't know this about him but apparently when he writes a song he likes to imagine himself like can i play this in a bar with 200 people and am i going to be totally embarrassed yeah that's that's his bar right there yeah it's yep. a good <laughs> oh, by the way going going back to microphones i was wondering what what mike rob was using last week so if 
if we could find that out at some point. I can send it to you. It's uh, some <laughs> Rus- Russian ribbon mics that this guy makes at, at his house, and awesome. you, have to, you have to email him, and then he gives you a price after that. And I guess they're really affordable, and he sends them to you right oh, away. I just I love the way it sounded. That <laughs> did like, sound I good. Want, I want to get my hands on that. <laughs> you can also get those uh, the Cascade Fatheads. Yeah, uh, I those... almost bought one of those instead of buying this beta 57 and i just was like i knew this was this would be more versatile so the russian mic maybe is it, it's probably cooler but i don't know what it what it costs those fat heads are not too bad i think yeah. they're about 300 per yeah they're pretty they're way cheaper than i expected them to be we'll have to ask rob how much his russian mic is i think it's <laughs> around there around that amount nice. that's a great deal yeah. if the guy just makes them mm-hmm. like Absolutely. that's a crazy deal they sound great too and he usually just records drums at his house with just those two as an overhead and then i think a kick mic and maybe a snare mic and that's it that's awesome yeah yeah that rules but to answer your question too mike about um how i got into write my own songs too was i i was in the milwaukee music scene for upwards of you know more than two decades and when I moved down to Nashville, there was not a lot of people that I knew at the time living down here that were like-minded, like that liked the Ramones. And, or, I mean, they probably liked the Ramones, but it wasn't an influence of theirs. And so I wanted to, to write rock and roll songs. And so I just figured I'd try doing it myself. And I, I will say that what got me writing it is like anger. Like I would just write things that I was really upset about. So that's why my songs have like really depressive lyrics, but it's they don't sound that depressing, I guess. Is what I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah, to me, the, your songs sound like very heavily like Ramones influenced. I hear a lot of Ramones in that first Mini Meltdowns record. For sure. Unless I'm mistaken. It sounds very Ramonesy to me, no. which is a good thing. I like, I like the Ramones. <clears throat> me too. You're the best. The Kings. Yeah, I don't know, like, I don't know what, I think I really was, like, way into recording. Like, I was, I had a cassette four track, and I was just obsessed with recording shit, so I think I started writing songs out of a necessity for something to record. How were those early recordings? Embarrassing. (laughs) Like, the the songs are completely embarrassing. I found the old box of, like, four track tapes, like, a year ago. I'm like, oh, maybe there's like some shit on here that I could like put out. <laughs> no. Oh boy. No. <laughs> there's a there's a funny acapella version that me and Josh Caterer did of of my girl, where we played the instruments like holding our noses, like, <laughs> <laughs> and we did the whole instrument track like that, and then we sang over it and like quadruple tracked our vocals, which that's probably like the most releasable thing on there. <laughs> <laughs> but then it was like a little while after I got my four track, Josh moved into my parents' house with us for like a year. And so if I wanted to record something on like a Saturday, I'd be like, Josh, I want to record, like go write a song. And then he would go up to his room for like an hour and come back down and be like, I got one. And I think some of those, like I think like Lucky Day off of Born to Quit came from one of those. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, Crazy. I think also might have been like can't help the teardrops or two or three songs off of born to quit that were from josh living at my parents house and me saying like let's record something today and he would like go like hold up in his room and like fiddle around and then come back down like i got one (laughs) that's awesome but i found like i don't know about you guys but i feel like if i write songs the ones that come out like really fast are usually the better ones Uh, yeah absolutely it's like always, it's like in like the Ergs days, the ones that everybody loved were the ones that literally writing them took as long as it took to play them the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just spit out the words, spit out the chords, and then quickly was like, oh, that's good. Record it. And those are the one. that's the Pray for Rains, that's the like books about Miles Davis. Like those are those songs are the ones that just took no effort at all. And, you know, I hear a lot of, I watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books about musicians and they're like, yeah, I don't know. Like that just, this just fell out of me one time and it was, you know, this song. 
<laughs> yeah, it's weird. I feel like if the lyrics don't come immediately, for me, like, usually I'll, like, play around and I'll, have, I'll sing gibberish, like, to a melody. Yeah. And then usually, like, lyrics just, like, pop out that's as the that's best, happening. That's the best way of getting lyrics down is the gibberish. And then if they You're don't scrolling. pop out, I can't get them. Like, I just get stuck. To be brutally yeah. honest with you, I won't even finish songs if it takes me more than an hour to come up with something. Like, I have, like, riffs and melodies and gibberish words, but if it's not all totally written within that hour, then I just, I'll never go back to it for some reason. Do you even, do you document it in any way? Like, record it on a I phone? Do. or Usually voice memos. And then, um, apparently, I, I don't remember what it's called, but there's like that new voice memos thing where you can actually through Apple where you could just lay down a guitar and vocal and it adds bass and drums for you. Oh yeah. Mu music, music memos. Thank you. Yeah. Music memos. <laughs> the day that came out, I wrote oh. like 15 songs that day. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that. It was so cool to hear like, yeah, it just like kind of approximates what you're playing on the guitar on bass and drums. Wow. It's kind of, it's kind of right most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean you I could was... just do a really poor version of your guitar and vocal too and it just and it know, plays drums there. to it. Yeah. It do and you like, have to play to a click or anything or no? Not at all. No. Wow. Uh, sometimes it gets it wrong and you can like go back in and like kind of change the feel or if it like didn't get that it was in 3/4 instead of 4/4 four, four or whatever, but it's it's usually pretty fucking right on. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I had no idea. That's yeah, like, check it like, out. I mean, I, I, that would be huge for people that don't know how to play drums. Yeah. I think especially. All right, well, we're c getting about 10 minutes to an hour here, so I'll kick off another tune. I'm going to play one off of my first solo record that came out in 2001, I think. Um, it's called Sleepwalking. I had a friend request this. I don't know if he's still if he's watching or not this would be this was probably like in the first like 12 songs I ever wrote past the past the ones where I was I had a few where I directly copied Jesus and Mary Chain songs <laughs> because they, <laughs> it was like the Ramones but slower so it's easier to play but so this would be it's true yeah in phase really two true. of writing songs this is like the one of the first that I wrote all right gotta get my setup going again And I've heard that about Jesus and Mary Chain before. I've always wanted to like cover their entire Darklands record just for the fuck of it. I thought that would be fun. Maybe you'll try it and it'll become the EP version. Yeah. <laughs> it probably will. Because <laughs> there'll be like a couple songs where it's like, oh, I can't sing that one or I, I don't like that one. Because <laughs> for, for my Weezer project, I was going to cover one one song off of each of their records from the blue album up to uh pacific daydream mm -hmm. but then i don't know i lost my way <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to do that yeah i have like i think i'll just put out the six or so that i have done like fuck it all right here we go <clears throat> i 
why can't it be like way back when when it wasn't so hard I've wanted out I don't want that now I don't want that now and I know it hasn't been so good but I know I could love you like love you That's great. Great great song, man. I almost hear like a little, uh, a little Josh Caterer influence in that a little bit. I mean, I would suppose there's probably some Josh Caterer influence in every song I write because I (laughs) more or less learned how to play music, like playing to his songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I when I joined the Popes, I had only been drumming for maybe like a year and a half. So I think that was what was kind of unique about that band was we pretty much all learned how to play instruments together because we were all very young when we when we started. I was going to say, did you grow up together? Uh, well, the three of them were brothers. So well, they, well, yes. right. they obviously grew up <laughs> together. Um, I, was, I think I was like 16 or 17 when, when you, I joined the when band. You. So we were kind of, you know, we were all very raw on our instruments and we we pretty much learned how to play instruments like by playing together so i think that's why we kind of sounded the way that we do if that makes sense yeah that yeah i mean i i always say that like that like i'm never gonna find a band like the ergs ever again because we started playing together in like middle school and you know it's even to this day like you know so many years later we just get into a practice room and if there's a new song it's just they they just know how to play it they know exactly what i'm going for it's it's like a a musical energy that i'm never going to have with anybody else (laughs) i get that (laughs) it's like being brothers i get the same vibe when i listen to limbeck play like when you guys came through and and like we're Warming up for the rock room sesh, John. Like I, I got that same kind, like a Ergs, Pope's thing, where it's like every member of this band like knows how to play in that band. Totally. If that makes sense. Totally. It totally makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's we play maybe once every three years now, just because all of them are married and have kids and don't have the time. So we could step away for three years, come back, and it's, it's like we never left off in a, in a bad space and we were just it's all positive and we know how to do it we know how to act with each other it's it's beautiful how old were you guys when when Limbeck got together um well i i joined kind of right at the the beginning part of 2005 ish so i was i was in there probably about four or five years after they were a band okay um but I, th- I think around 19 and 20 years old for most of them. And I know that even because Justin, the bass player, is actually the only original member of Limbeck. It was a high school band for him. And it was started as a joke. And the original band name was the Bastard Sons of Buddy Limbeck from Trials in Charge because Willie yes. Aim- Will Ames lived... Uh, and they were friends with Will Ames' kid, so apparently, they were, he, Will Ames has come to the show, and they they shortened the band name because they didn't want to offend him, because <laughs> Buddy Limbeck was coming to the show, so they called it Limbeck. That's so, so Justin, funny. Justin knows it as a high school band, but then Rob and Pat kind of got in right right towards after that when they changed to Limbeck. Oh, that's great. <laughs> he, he's a fantastic bl- bass player. Dude, 
He's he's so good. Like the tone is so. Uh, it's it's interesting because bands come in here and they all play through the same gear. Basically, everybody plays the same drum kit, and ninety percent of the time they play through the same amps. And like the difference in the tones from different people playing is like shocking to me. Like that's the same amp, and it sounds like a thousand different ways, just depending on who's playing it. The same with the drums. Like the same drum kit tuned up the exact same way. Yeah. Sounds different when I'm mixing it. Drastically so different. You would swear it was a different kit. And Everybody like, has their own feel. Yeah. It's cool. It's like their soul, you know? You can tell what it is by their soul, what they're doing. But Justin also has that really weird Japanese, like, knockoff Fender bass, too. That's part of his tone. I mean, it's like there's probably only like a hundred of them in the world. Is it an actual Fender or is it a Japanese brand? It's a Japanese brand. Oh. Just a, a knockoff of a jazz bass. Huh. I like the actual, the Japanese made Fender stuff I think is great. Mm. I, like I have a Japanese Strat that's I like better than any of my American Fender guitars, which is weird. I think but, there was a Japanese version of the J Mascus that everybody was saying that that's that was like the best one that they made. Crazy. Yeah, and the Japanese ones are cheaper. I yeah, don't, I don't think they they don't make anything in Japan anymore, as far as I know. Crazy. Well, what kind of song do you have geared up for us here, John? Um, this one's called "I Want to Die," and it's it's not as sad as it sounds. Uh, basically. I was reading through the the Didi Ramon biography lobotomy for like the third time in 2018. And there's that, the part of the book where he's talking about how they're making the video for I want to live. And he says something to the effect of like, I wanted to die. And I just liked his sense of humor in the book. So I figured I'd, I'd do like a kind of like a call and response to that. But actually I, I had a horrible year myself in 2018 so I, I figured it, it was pretty well suited anyways <laughs> All right. Very nice. Beautiful. Steven Lopez in the chat says, this song is awesome. Is that Texas Steve Lopez? Steven? Steve? Is that you? If it is, he plays drums in the band Break Lights. Mm. Oh, awesome. On Wiretap Records. Fantastic drummer. Played drums for The Bigger Empty when we played down in Texas years ago. And flew out to Boston and played with us there. That was fun times. Nice. And he likes that song. 
Thanks. I like that song too. Like that's one of the ones to me that's like has a real Ramones vibe to it in a good yeah, way. Yeah. Well, you were saying, Mikey, too, like your whole like Riverdale's Danny Vapid yeah. thing. <laughs> I, I played in Screeching Weasel for a little bit. So they they were always a big influence of mine as well. Yeah. The thing they do. Yeah. They were, they were pretty fucking great. <laughs> but yeah, there's like that. There's those like classic, just like, back to you and like those songs. They're just like, who? How do you write? How do you write that song? <laughs> There's so many good songs there. And then Ben just released that new record, out of nowhere. And yeah, have you guys listened to it? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's so good, man. I, I haven't listened to that one yet. I'll, I'll uh, definitely check it out. It's it's really incredible. That song "Problematic" is one of my faves on there. It's kind of like yeah. a '60s doo-wop kind of thing. I like a lot of the Va- the Dan Vapid stuff too. Like a lot of his. Yeah, that Mopes record is just phenomenal, and all his Riverdale songs are perfect. <laughs> yeah, he's got he's got like an exceptional voice for that genre as well. Yeah, I think. like right. He just sounds like one of those guys that should be singing songs like that. Totally. Yep. My friend Tim Schweiger. He once said, he was like, God, if, if Vapid was writing songs in the 50s, he'd be like as big as Dion and <laughs> stuff, you know, which I couldn't disagree with. Right. Yeah, he'd, he'd be one of those guys that like write songs for like 500 different artists, probably. Yeah. Just totally. like sitting in an office somewhere, like shooting out the hits. <laughs> How good of a job would that be? It'd just be like one of those dudes that just sits up there and like writes hits and sends them out. I know. I read about that all the time. Or you, like your your day job was to go to an office and just sit at a piano all day. Yeah. And come up with, will you still love me tomorrow? <laughs> There's got to be a lot of pressure there, though, too. That is. But I wonder if that's like what fed it all. It's like I have to come up with something, and then you just come up with something brilliant. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I tend to do better like writing if I if I put myself in the mindset, like I'm going to write a song today. Yeah. And like, you just go down and just like, and you just make yourself finish like whatever you're doing mm-hmm. and it, maybe it will suck. <clears throat> but like, if you do that enough times, like there'll be a good one in there here and there. I think I've, yeah. I've gotten away from it, but I think it's a healthy habit. If you write songs to just like go to wherever you go to write songs and like start and finish one in one sitting and then just do that repeatedly a hundred times and then out of the hundred you should have maybe 10 good ones yeah you know if you're me it might it'll take you a hundred to get 10 good ones (laughs) i agree though you just got to do it like you know if like if they're yeah like that's i've I've read that that's a good way to get rid of writer's block is just just go do it and if it sucks it sucks then you throw that away and then keep going yeah Um, it's it's so easy to like judge one like when you're a quarter of the way through it like you're you're fired up from it at first right and then like after 35 minutes you're like this might not be any good yeah right yeah but you don't know yeah you don't know until you put it out (laughs) that's like the most (laughs) the most exciting thing about putting out a record to me is finding out if the songs were actually good (laughs) (laughs) You have to you have a know? you have to have a certain amount of like blind faith. Yeah. Doing. <laughs> Jeff says play a song by the Turn. I, I I called my solo thing the Turn once. What's your last name, Jeff? Do I know you? Is it Jeff? Sorely, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but the Turn didn't have any songs. They were all my songs. So technically, I played a song by the Turn. There you go. Very true. <laughs> I was just doing a tour and I wanted to call it a band instead of my name, which is never, I should have just never done oh, that. Oh, it was a solo tour, but you, yeah. you named it a band. Yeah. And then like the bigger empty is kind of the same where it's like, I have Amanda sing some of the songs, but it's like all my, it's all the same songs. Mm-hmm. And then I called it the bigger empty and I should have just kept it a solo thing because when you change the name of a thing, like people don't follow. Yeah. But it's okay. also kind of nice not calling it your exact name too, because then it like, I know for me when I when I wanted to release my own songs, I didn't want to call it my name because I'm like, kind of I had there's like this Dave Matthews 
connotation there or something. It's nice, Mikey, that you got the Mikey Erg thing going. Yeah, know? but when I, when I was making that first the first Mikey Erg record, I didn't I I had like a lot of conversations with a lot of different people and got a lot of different opinions about like I was like, do I do I name it a a thing? Do, you know, like do I do yeah. like a Foo Fighters thing where I name it something? Do I do Mikey Erg? Do I do it under Mikey Yannick? Like, do, do I do it under my real name? Do I do it under Mikey Erg to try to grab some people that were into the old band? And like, ultimately, ultimately, I just decided to do it under Mikey Erg just because it's like, I, that's my like, you know, punk name or whatever, my, <laughs> my stage name. And, you know, it's like, if anybody knows about anything that I did previously, they'll they might like stop and check it out. Like, you know, there's like a second more that they would look at the record because, Oh, I think I know that name from somewhere as opposed to just being like a, a different name. So I just went yeah. with it. Yeah. It's, it's so weird how if you name it something different, it just doesn't translate. Just like when we started the band Duval, which was like yeah. three, three quarters of the Pope's and we played a lot of Pope's songs same singer same songwriter and and like the crowds and and attention it got was like maybe a third you yeah. know a, a half to a third of what the popes would different name it's like all versus the descendants right yeah and it's like yeah. they sound the same like different singer it's the same band yeah no i, I never i never understood that because I, I i love those all records so much and i think they're I mean, and like I, I always thought that like technically some of those all records were better than the Descendants records because they. I agree. It was like thirteen songs, <laughs> and you know, and I love the Descendants records, but you know, there's a there's a few Descendants songs on some of the records that are just like, you know, like you know, the song of them just farting for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like not even enjoy enjoy is a great song and then there's like the actual song of them just farting for <laughs> a minute and a half it's like well that didn't need to be on <laughs> yeah none of the so, all records have any of that stuff <laughs> there's a couple like i think the top the top like 10 or 12 all songs are as good as any descendant song i yeah i think so too i i yeah yeah, I don't know. I'm the maybe, wrong person to ask. But maybe that's a hot yeah. take, but like, I don't know. I, I think growing up, I, I always liked all more than the Descendants. Like, certainly when I, as I got older, I started to like, like realize I think these these all songs are. But now the Descendant songs are like Descendant. Like, Cool to Be You was one of my favorite Descendants records because it just felt like an all record, mm -hmm. but it was Milo singing because it was definitely like the kind of more mature songwriting with Milo singing all of it. Yeah, I think it, I thought I it think was the Bill, best of all worlds. I, I think like the more whichever records Bill writes more of, I think are the ones I like better. Like I feel like he's like yeah. the best. Same here. Yeah. He's like the best melody writer of, of that yeah. group of guys, I think. <clears throat> that descent like I didn't really know Bill wrote a lot of those songs until I watched that Descendants movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe it's just like I've always been a huge fan. I just didn't know that single part. That's, of that. a, that's the most fascinating thing about them to me too. Is that you know they all wrote. That's so cool. Like, and you know when you when you listen to the first thing that Chad, the first record Chad is on, and the first song is original me. I always wanted to ask them like, when he came to practice with that, were you just like, oh my god, <laughs> like, like <laughs> what do you do? Like, what do you do when someone brings you that song? Like I get to play this brilliant song. I don't know. It's like, and then and Carl comes up with Coolidge out of nowhere on his first record with the yeah. band. Like, it, yeah, it's so Co great. Coolidge is like Coolidge is one of their best. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that was the first Descendant song I heard. Yeah. And it was in like it was in a skate video, maybe the like an old Santa Cruz video or something, like Wheels of Fire or something. That story know. checks out. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I know a lot of people that got into a lot of that, a lot of that SAC stuff just from skate videos. <laughs> yeah, that was the way, like back in the day, it was like you'd watch a skate video or you'd buy like Thrasher magazine and see which albums had ads. 
and right. then you go, you just blind, blindly go buy it at a store. That's awesome. Like, that's how I that's how I got into the replacements. They had a full page ad in Thrasher magazine. Really? And there was a record store, and I saw the record. I'm like, well, this is in Thrasher, so like, it's for what re- for what, what era? Like what record? It was uh, Please to Meet Me. Cool. It was in '87. Wow. It's and so I think, funny. I I do not expect that that record to be the one that was in a Thrasher magazine. Yeah, I thought you were going to say like Hoot and Nanny. <laughs> And I bet I, you a lot of skaters though are disappointed with that record with like the horns and the production. Yeah, it's the first one where they kind of started getting like just poppy. Yeah, <laughs> totally, like totally. like Tim was Tim was getting that way, and then Please to Meet Me was like full on that way. Yeah, I think I bought the Dead Milkmen, Big Lizard in my backyard. The same process. They had an ad in in Thrasher magazine, and it's like. That name sounds cool, and the art's cool. Yeah. I'm gonna buy that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, what a great record. Well, cool. Let's let's get a one more rock number from you, Mikey. All right. I suppose I'm gonna do uh, songs off the uh, Waxville Castles album that I made um, a couple years ago, last year, or something like that. Um, this song's called uh, Hoplin Superette. Take a picture of my face from last night. I'll over the front pages of the Post Gazette. The world is turning upside down. Fancy seeing around. Sometimes I wish they'd take this town level out. Give me all those years I wish. A lot of your songs just sound very like effortless. That's what I would say, in in that a good way. It's like it's it's like they just kind of like roll out of you. It's cool. Yeah, I mean that that was one of the ones that just like I was demoing stuff for what I thought was going to be the new record, and just kind of put the voice memo app on and played that song, like pretty much exactly how that was. Like didn't really change any lyrics or anything, and I don't know where it came from. Don't know what happened. <laughs> I still I want to mix a release of yours one day. I would like to do that. Let's make that happen. Why don't we do a? Why don't we three? Here's the fun quarantine project. Why don't we three? Like I will cover a Limbeck song or a Mini Meltdown song. Either way. I'll cover one of those. 
John, you cover a Mikey Erg song, and Mikey, you cover one of mine, and then we'll put I'm it out. Done and done, man. That's done like and done. Absolutely. <laughs> and like, if you guys want to do tra- like, if you need somebody to mix, you can just like record tracks and send them to me. I'll mix them all. Yeah, that's I that's mean, even more perfect. Yeah, let's just do that. <laughs> We've all got gear, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it, in these in these trying times. In this new normal, having this gear is like it's invaluable to have this gear. Yeah, absolutely. and then like knowing people, knowing other people that have this gear, is just yeah, awesome. I've, I've already done a couple like you know, project like an old band of mine is getting back together that hasn't played a show since I don't know two thousand nine or something. And we're just like we're all stuck in our houses. Like we've all got shit. Let's make a record. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're going to do it. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, we'll all cover each other, and then it'll be um, the Singing Drummer's Bummer EP. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it writes itself. It writes itself. It's going to come out on Red Girlfriend Records. I'm just going to say that. Yeah, we'll just say that. Josh, if you're if you're watching. He's probably not, you're not watching. You're not watching. We'll, we'll, send it, we'll send you the link later. Here's <laughs> yeah. your next project. I'll tell him. <laughs> we can tell him tomorrow, like, hey, you're going to put this out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's not much commitment if it's just digital only, right? That's true. That should yeah. cost them about like five bucks or something. <laughs> so next Friday, I'm going to have on uh, Kaylin West from the band Tiny Stills. I need a I need another guest. I like to have a couple. Any suggestions on who that should be? I think you should have uh, my buddy Josh Burwanger on from the East oh, East yeah. Anniversary. Okay. He's he's listening in right now too. Nice. I'm sure he'd love to do it. You say he was in the anniversary? To see that. He was, yeah. I think we played when I was in Alkaline Trio, I think we might have played with them some, probably. Yeah, he mentioned that when I told him that you were I was doing this with you. He's like, Oh yeah, anniversary played with the trio a couple times. But then he was also in the Only Children, if you ever heard of those records. And then he has that solo thing called Burwanger. Oh. Just under his last name. Okay, I'm gonna listen to that tomorrow. And then, Josh, if you're watching still, maybe we bored him. We've, we're hitting, we're closing in on 90 minutes, which is where I like to keep it. But cool, I will hit him up, and I'll listen to his music. That that would be cool. He also has a Sure, um, what is it, SM7B? SM7B. Yeah. Hopefully. I have one too. Should I should I put mine up? <laughs> time? Yes, you should. you should. I mean, Sure has given me a free mic, so why, I don't know why I'm talking into the AKG. <laughs> They haven't given me anything. Because it's the 414, Mike. It's the 414. It is the 414. I'll just start telling people that it's a sure. Like, some people will know. Some people won't know. Yeah, true. He said it was a sure. I've been looking all over for this microphone. I can't find it anywhere. Okay, to wrap it up, I will do... My buddy has these things called uh, pod decks. Okay. And they're pretty cool. It's like basically random interview questions for people that do podcasts he's not paying me to put these on but he should <laughs> <laughs> but they they can be fun questions i'll ask you each one a random question sounds good all right for john what's one bad habit you're trying to get rid of oh god dude <laughs> um I would say eating sweets, but I'm not trying to get out of it. I'm just trying to not eat as much because I, I got sober about eight years ago and I've always had a sweet tooth, but I mean, I, I re- it went really through the roof and I eat a lot of dessert and sweets, but yeah, I, I need to chill a bit. <laughs> you are, I'm right there with you. We're not, yeah. Especially in these times. Yeah. Pri- prior yeah. to the, Prior to the shutdown, like I had just recently lost like 23 pounds by stopping yeah. the sweets. All I did was switch to Diet Coke and I quit buying. I used to always have like Entenmann's donuts around. Yeah. Oh, those are good. And like a bunch of candy bars. And like that would be like probably 40% of what I would eat every day would be like donuts and candy bars <laughs> and regular Coke. <laughs> so I switched to a Diet Coke. But the Diet Coke was Splenda, but now that's out of stock ev- everywhere, so I'm back 
to the Diet Coke, to the regular Coke. Regular and Coke Classic in a can is so Coke good. Classic. Oh, God, it's, it's good. true. Uh, but I'm up like 15 pounds since this shit started. It's all it's all in my gut. Like being a skinny person with the gut is like it's not cool. <laughs> it's not a good look. I was always like I just you know we I just buy meals by meal. Like I I always just went to the grocery store every day and just bought like I never kept like food around like like and two so, weeks of food just like one yeah so, time. so now there's well no just like because you know i live in i live in astoria and the grocery store is a block away so i just would uh, what do i feel like having for dinner tonight go buy it but now i have now there's just we stocked up so now there's just food around and i've just been eating it <laughs> a lot <laughs> i think we all have <laughs> gotta be ca- gotta be careful with the quarantine snacks yeah <laughs> All right, here's here's one pod deck question for Mike to wrap mm-hmm. up the show. What is something you like that most people don't? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think, excuse me, I think I love Frank Zappa, and I don't know a lot of people that do. Uh, I feel like I'm always struggling to find people to talk about Frank Zappa with. Um, there's a lot of things that I like that a lot of people don't like because I have notoriously all over the map tastes and just will watch and consume and read anything. And yeah, so. I think John is a fellow Zappa fan, aren't you? Uh, I don't mind him. I don't. <laughs> I don't like go home and put them on, but it, when somebody puts on a, a good song by him, I, I totally don't mind it. Well, that's the I, thing about him is that like there's there's so much, so like there's bound to be something that you like. But yeah, I I go through phases where I'll just only listen to him for like eight months at a time. Wow! Wow! wow. I love it. I think People Eli. Should... I think Eli likes him. Eli oh yeah, from the Pope. So maybe. Hit up Eli on Facebook. He might be a Zappa friend for you. I will. That'd be great. We we should all just like what we like too. I'm I'm no, guilty of thing. being a huge snob, but I mean, at the end of the day, if if you like something, you should like it and be proud of. Yeah, I've I've never been a uh the the term guilty pleasure never made sense to me. Yeah. It's like just like it. That's that's a good um, that's a good point, John. Like, I think in in my youth when I was a youth. <laughs> Um, I would get for no reason kind of like judgmental of people's tastes. And it's like, you like that, like, Wah. but yeah. as I've grown older and I, I've made a conscious effort to, to be like, okay, if people post a, b- a bunch of stuff on Facebook about a band, I don't like, I, these days I just shut up about it. Cause it's like, if they're having fun with it, then great. Yeah. yeah like seriously. if it's like music or art or a movie that like it entertains you then like good that's yeah. good and when i was <laughs> when i was in high school like it's funny you say that i wouldn't like some i would take a hard stance of stuff it was if it wasn't punk for because i thought i was like super punk and i'm like yeah. oh yeah that's not punk it's not cool i was just being a stupid kid really i feel like everybody went through that <laughs> where like i definitely sold all of my like non-punk records when i went <laughs> when i got into punk you know all the zeppelin and yes and Rush records went out the window and got sold so I could buy new records and then I bought them all back like a year later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think what punk is one of those things when you first like get into it you almost have to like prove to yourself like how punk you are. Yeah. Uh, cuz I, I like prior to getting into punk I really liked the that first Poison record. Oh hell yeah. Oh. Look what Dude. the cat dragged Look the cat in. Track in, yeah. And yeah, open man. up and say, ah, it's great, too. And then it's yeah. like, I love those records. <laughs> and then I get into punk, and then I hate it. I hate yeah, it. Yeah, right. It's like, cock rock, fuck that. And then, But then <laughs> now, like, you hear those songs, it's like, those are good songs. <laughs> uh, uh, Fallen Angel? What a fucking tune that is. <laughs> I would say hair rock in general. I, I'm totally pro hair rock. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up listening to a lot of that stuff, and... It's mm-hmm. still like those songs kind of have you heard the uh Samantha Seven record? Nope. Mm-hmm. It was uh uh CC DeVille's like kind of like it probably early two thousands, like almost power poppy glam band. 
they're it's so good it's like it's it's essentially like really good pop punk and he's huh. singing i have to check it's it great. out then samantha seven i think they only made okay. one record did he write much of that the poison I think, stuff i think so i think Probably. he was like yeah the i think he was like the melody guy in poison because <laughs> these, wow. these yeah these songs are great <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, I think we are at 91 minutes. I think that's right. as long as anybody that needs to listen to drummers and singers <laughs> and drummers talk to each other. <laughs> but we can do it again sometime. Would love yes. to. Um, thank you very much for, for joining me tonight. I hope you both have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks for thank having you. us. Yeah, Great thank you weekend. so much. This was fun. I love you guys. And thanks, everyone, for watching. And... We'll be back next Friday at 7 Central. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.